Welcome to Second Tech, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM is once again talking about entering into special pricing deals with energy intensive companies as it forecasts a surplus of power supply until the early 2020s. Terence Creamer joins me to talk about the development. Hi Terence. Hi Snow. After years of power cuts and shortages, how is it that ESCOM is now talking about a surplus? Yes, I think the mindset in South Africa is still one of load shedding and Actually, since 2015, there has been a major change in the supply-demand dyna dynamic. Obviously, for the last 10 years, uh, electricity demand has not grown. So the economy hasn't grown, plus there's been this uh, suppressed demand for the uh, as a result of the fact that Eskom was unable to supply during the period from 2008 up to, 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 up to 2015. So we've had that long period of deficit, which suppressed demand, and also we've had this very weak economic growth. And then there's also been uh, the addition of uh, capacity. So we've seen the IPP renewables come in. We've seen some of the, the large Eskom build coming in, but that's just the first stages, the first few units of Madupi, the first unit of Kosili and then Ngula. And there's still the other units to come. So we've got about 10,000 megawatts plus coming in, plus the renewables coming in. And we've got this uh, flat demand. And really we, what we had during uh, the power crisis of 2008 to 2015 was not a capacity problem in South Africa. We had enough capacity, nameplate capacity installed. We had an availability problem, and that availability problem has also come under control. Seemingly, Eskom's got its plants operating at a, at a levels that it's you know at a, a more expected, sort of closer to the 80% availability, whereas it had fallen below the 70. Oh, between the 70 and 80 percent, in some cases below the 70 percent level. So that would really led to the shortages during that period. So we, we are in a period of, it seems, a surplus if the energy availability is maintained by Eskom and with this additional capacity coming in. And that's why we're seeing now talk of uh, you know, Eskom resistance to signing new PPAs with the renewables companies, as well as this talk of closing uh, five power stations starting from next year which is causing major political reactions already. You've seen the, the coal transporters and the major protest to the union buildings. And we see the unions in the form of the National Union of Mine Workers, but also NUMSA, um, having problems with this uh, plan. And we're probably going to see quite a bit of protest action. But there is the shift that uh, has happened. And I think South Africans are, are, are just coming to terms with the fact that we're almost back to the future. We're back to the late 1980s where we uh, had that surplus capacity and, and during that time power stations were mothballed, uh, which became the so-called Samunya plant. Ironically, some of that Samunya plant that was brought back in in, in the form of return to service is now some of the plant that Eskom is talking about closing down. What is the plan for raising electricity demand? <coughs> well, the new corporate plan at Eskom uh, puts this as a priority. So. Uh, obviously, the, the, what was seen as some of the low-hanging fruit is trying to get uh, some of this uh, ex surplus capacity into the region, so trying to raise exports. And now the target that Eskimo set itself is raise exports by 8% a year over, I think, the next five years. So that's quite an ambitious plan. The difficulties there um, is, one, it's they small markets, but the other difficulty is that um, the, the, the connectivity into these markets is not as, as it strong as it should be or could be and therefore there's some constraints there as well as the drought conditions um, have eased say for instance in Zambia where they rely a lot on hydropower and those shortages were acute during the drought period you know the rains have come so th the shortages are not as acute as they were so th that is an ambitious target they've also set a target of 2.1 percent growth a year uh, in local sales. Now that is a very ambitious target. <laughs> if you think about where we're coming from, we're really talking about flat line growth, if not negative um, demand growth in, uh, for electricity. Um, we've had the, especially the power intensive sectors in the mining and the smelting environment uh, having their own headwinds. So not only power prices, but also commodity prices have been down. So setting a target of 2.1%, which is interestingly aligned to the current integrated resource plan vision of 2.1% growth a year uh, is, a, is an ambitious target, but that seems to be what Eskom is focusing on. And uh, they're saying that what we need, uh, if you know, if we're going to be, a, be able to sign PPAs, keep power stations open, and obviously move into a, 
a sort of more smooth cycle of build, both IPP build and ESKIM build. Obviously, ESKIM wants to build nuclear. And you need a sustained growth in energy intensive, and not only sustained growth, but energy intensive growth. So that's currently one of the mantras at the utility. Are special deals for power intensive firms likely to receive regulatory and societal support? Well, societal support is going to be very interesting. Now, we must remember, if go back, past our minds back is not so long ago, to 2008 when the power cuts first started and the big bogeyman and the, 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 the big villain of the piece was held up as the aluminium smelters. Now, those aluminium smelters, as I said right at the beginning, it's like a back to the future type scenario. Those are really investments made because of the surplus that Eskom had during the late 80s and 90s. And electricity surplus was actually South Africa's one and only industrial policy tool. If you looked at what DTR had in the form of incentives, they were quite parsimonious at that stage. But they did have electricity as a uh, cheap or low cost electricity as a big industrial policy push. And arguably, they had the motor industry development plan. Those were the two legs of the industrial policy. If you go back to the Mandela administration, uh, there wasn't much else in the way of incentives. There were some things on the fringes and there was a tapering back of some of the, the perverse incentives that we had in, during apartheid, like gas, uh, uh, that gave exporters incentives that, that really that didn't make sense. But uh, so, th so we're really <laughs> looking at restarting some of these special pricing arrangements that really were, became very unpopular uh, during the time of deficit. So it's going to be a hard sell in society. And I think the regulator is going to have to take a tough look at this. Already we've seen Eskom approach NERSA with two pricing deals for, to try and start uh, restart some silicon smelters. Um, um, NERSA didn't re reject it out of hand, but they, did, they didn't uh, approve it. They want a sort of more comprehensive view as to how they should approach these special pricing arrangements. We know that the energy intensive user group is quite in favor of this. They've done some work on this, and they're saying that there's no real regulatory uh, policy or legislative impediment to special pricing arrangements. Um, and, but what they're saying is that these projects are long-term in nature and they can't be too short-term. Now, Eskom is very nervous of entering into long-term special pricing deals. We saw it with the silicon smelters. They're offering a, a two-year deal because they don't want to be caught on the wrong side of this again, as well as there was that whole era of embedded de derivatives that affected uh, um, uh, Eskom's finances, and I think they, they're nervous of any commodity price-linked deals. But on the other hand, we have, we have the surplus, we've got a slow-growing economy, we've possibly got pent-up uh, unused demand in idle capacity in smelting and mining, that if the mining environment legislatively and policy settles, um, there's a, there is some potential to re restart the brown, some of that brownfield capacity um, with that certainty as commodity prices rise, and even potentially some greenfield activity, although that is few, that, that those sort of opportunities seem few and far between at the moment. But things do change, as we've seen in the electricity uh, environment. So there is, it is on the agenda. Special pricing deals is on the agenda. The, yeah, the energy intensive user group um, suggests that uh, this, this, is not, this isn't discounting, because if you look at the cost of supply, to a power intensive firm to Eskom, it's actually a, a lot cheaper than supplying a household. And they're saying, you know, actually, if, if you look at the way the numbers are done, Eskom charges well above the cost of supply and therefore energy intensive businesses, and this is a very controversial point, um, actually subsidize residential uh, users. And I think mathematically that's true, but that's not true for <laughs> most households who play high, very high uh, municipal tariffs and don't agree with that uh, scenario. But anyway, th that beside the point, th the issue is we have the surplus. Should we use it to stimulate growth? And if we do, and we do set up pricing arrangements, how should these be structured? Now, none of that, I think, is clear yet. I think that's going to require some sort of meeting of minds amongst Eskom and their client base, and then taking that to the regulator almost as a package with government, with the DTR, with the National Treasury, to say we agree. But I think time horizons will probably be quite important here because uh, I don't think we want to go back to a situation where you know, uh, executives sitting around the table, as we saw in 2008, one banking executive say we need to shut down the smelters in order to keep the lights on, and that caused major ups unhappiness. And then Eskom also having to try and get 
uh, a cost reflective tariff out of those big aluminium smelters, which I think they've they've only done partially since that crisis. So it's it's a it's a big issue. It's a it's one that's going to take a it's quite taxing, and it's going to have, need to take a lot of thought. But I think there is an opportunity, and maybe it's something that we have to look at, given the state of weak growth in this economy. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching, and join us again next time for more news analysis.